So good morning. I'm not going to do that. Good morning. Okay, we're not going to do that. But um, So I'm so excited to be here in Oklahoma. This actually is my first time to be in Stillwater. I've been in several other parts of Oklahoma, and I've heard a lot of things about OSU, and most of them have been true. You know, we were just driving along, and then like, boom, there's a campus. So uh, thank you all for having me here. I know that it's, it seems a little odd to have somebody from Georgia talking about alfalfa, because when you look at the maps, we don't grow it. Uh, if you can tell, we're, we're in that little, that little white area there. Uh, it is something we are working on, explaining to them that, yes, we do grow alfalfa and we, we can count. Uh, it just doesn't happen to be something that Ag Statistics currently collects data on. Um, but the fact is we can grow alfalfa in Georgia. We can do it pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is all farm pictures from, uh, from producers' farms, so these aren't the research plots. Uh, and so, you know, once they get going and they kind of accept and get over some of the mantras that it won't grow here, uh, it, it really works very well. Uh, now, we kind of do it differently than they do in a lot of the other areas and, and maybe how you all do it out here. Where we're seeing the greatest benefit is looking at alfalfa production in a mixture and specifically looking at it in, in Bermuda grass. So we always say that we take the, the queen of queen of forages, right, alfalfa, and we marry it with the king of grasses or warm season grasses, which would be Bermuda grass, and in my case, Tifton 85, and now we have a royal wedded union, and it works out really well for our producers. Now, we already know adding legumes to grasses helps improve things all along, right? We know it from a soil health standpoint. We know it from an animal performance standpoint, especially, of course, I'm beef, right? I'm beef trained, so I'm, I'm really looking at the impact on those animals. You know, it's going to increase the palatability, the intake, the digestibility, the nutrient content, uh, and in turn, the animal performance. So it's a great winning thing. I don't have to explain why we need to add legumes. We hear that all the time. But when we look at alfalfa added into Bermuda grass, and, and I have to say that I was in California a few weeks ago at the World Alfalfa Congress, and I gave a talk similar to this, and the guys were like, now listen, we know how to do alfalfa. How do we put the Bermuda grass in it? And I was like, I hadn't even thought about that, you know, that aspect. I can tell you how to do it. Uh, but I didn't even think about speaking from that standpoint because we're trying to teach people how to, to do the alfalfa component. We got Bermuda grass covered. Uh, so I will go from that aspect if anybody has the questions. Otherwise, we do have guides for that. Uh, so what does it do? It increases the yield per unit area. Uh, it increases our quality, so we have a decreased supplementation requirement for our animals. It'll increase the dry down time compared to alfalfa alone. So we see that when you have the alfalfa and the Bermuda grass, if you're cutting hay, that Bermuda grass actually keeps that alfalfa off of the ground. And so it helps get that air circulation around it. Uh, we're actually seeing uh, less leaf loss in that production. It's going to extend that land use. So our producers go from maybe four harvests a year on Bermuda grass to six to eight harvests a year with the alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture. It's going to fill in our forage gaps, and we're going to talk about some of these specifics. And then if you fail, if your alfalfa fails, you still have something in the field, right? So you're not having to go through a time point of what am I going to do now? My alfalfa stand didn't work out. And so that's a real good selling point for a lot of our producers that are trying to get back into it so they can tell me that it doesn't work, but when it does work out, everybody's happy. Um, so what do we think about this, or how did this kind of come along? Obviously, this is not a new idea. Um, talking with Joe Bouton, he always said, says, well, Glenn Burton did this way a long time ago whenever he was breeding uh, on the Tifton campus. And if you don't know who that is, he's the godfather of Bermuda grass. Uh, so he, a lot of the Bermuda grass varieties, he actually snuck it over here from another country. Um, but we started looking at the growth curves of Bermuda grass and the growth of alfalfa, and we see that where the slump happens in alfalfa production is when the Bermuda grass production works. And so this kind of works as a, as a good uh, way to give us some kind of forage all the way through here. The other thing that we notice is when you look at a soil rec or fertilizer recommendation, so you're looking at a soil test and you look at production and you put hybrid Bermuda grass up from a hay production standpoint and alfalfa up from a hay production standpoint, the only difference is the, Bermuda, is the nitrogen requirement. The alfalfa doesn't require it. All of the other nutrients are the same. You need the high rates of potash. You need the, the phosphorus and all the other things in that, in that system. So well, that makes sense, right? We're not actually having to add. We add the alfalfa. We're not having to add a lot else to that system. Uh, so a lot of our producers that already know and already manage their fertilizer on their Bermuda grass, they like that idea in that system. A lot of them like time on a tractor, but when I start talking about the number of harvests, they're kind of like, whoa, that is a lot of time on a tractor. 
Uh, so why we really like this, it gives us an ebb and flow relationship. And so we've seen, and, and we'll show the data for it, um, it, it really works out well that we see alfalfa production in the early part of the year. So we start getting production in that March through May time period when Bermuda grass really isn't doing anything. We get into the heat of the summer, that alfalfa is starting to slump, that Bermuda grass starts to hit, right? We start to get really, really a lot of contribution of that Bermuda grass. As that Bermuda grass starts to slow off into the fall, we get that alfalfa a contribution back and so now we're really finding a system that truly gives us that ebb and flow relationship without having too many things in the mix that start to compete with each other so we found that they're very complementary so if you don't know me and most of you don't uh, I have a very producer driven applied research program on the UGA Tifton campus I've been there about seven years what I mean by this is the work that I do is directly related to conversations that I have with the producers and I want things to be immediately ap applicable so I'm taking most of the risk but then you can come in and you can implement it in your farm so I'm at that point of the research step. So we're going to break this up a little bit. When I first started in 2016, the first thing we did was we developed some baleage projects. As I mentioned, alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures aren't a new thing, but they haven't been researched that heavily. And one of the questions that we had was when we started using the alfalfa we were working with, that we'd put them in a lot of different Bermuda grasses, but we hadn't put them in Tifton 85. Right, and currently Tifton 85 is the highest yielding, highest quality. Like if you're gonna go for a new hybrid Bermuda grass, that's the one we're gonna go for or recommend, but it's very competitive. So was it gonna outcompete the alfalfa? I'm glad to say that it worked out pretty well. Uh, and so the first thing that we did was we did a baleage project where we looked at uh, uh, Bulldog 805 alfalfa with Tifton 85 Bermuda grass compared to Tifton 85 Bermuda grass alone. Now, one of the things that we uh, had, or we've noticed in this system, in the southeast, and you all know about drought, right? We always have drought, but in the southeast, certain time periods we have that are rain, right? You know that you're gonna get those showers. You're not gonna get those three to four days that you need for dry hay production. And so we have found ourselves in a situation where baleage production makes sense. But when you look at baleage production for Bermuda grass alone, economically, it doesn't make sense. When you add something like alfalfa to that mixture, now you're starting to find a system that's paying for itself. Uh, so we established this project in, in 2016. Uh, we did this on a 14 inch row spacing. Uh, there's lots of work out there that looked at different row spacing, but if you do the seven inch row spacing, you're too close. And if you get a good alfalfa stand, you lose your Bermuda grass. Eventually you just shade out the Bermuda. If you go to a 20 inch or wider row spacing, so that would be every third row on your drill, then you end up with so much Bermuda grass when it gets competitive that the alfalfa just can't handle it. And so it shades it out. So we found the sweet spot in that 14 to 15 inch or every other row in your drill. Um, and and we, that's worked very well for our system. Uh, again, we harvested this based on all those alfalfa recommendations at the 10% bloom stage after that first harvest on a 28 to 35 day interval. Um, baleage again is a southeastern game changer for us. Like uh, we've already, we're starting to see finally some uh, some producers that are, are grabbing onto it and looking at it. But a lot of it is the climate differences that we're seeing. We're having more of those rain seasons. We're having time periods where we can't harvest our our, our forages. And so, what other opp opportunities do we have if we can eliminate the weather impact? We can't eliminate drought impact, but if we can eliminate the impact of of rain on that hay product. Uh, then that's really going to help us uh, in that situation. All right, so talking about the ebb and flow, so this is just showing some documentation of that. In this particular project, again, we ran it for three years, and we started looking at the botanical composition. And if you look at this, you know, we recommend 30% or greater um, legume in our mixtures, and then you don't have to put the nitrogen out. Like, that's an old, we know that as a standard truth. You see that we didn't quite hit that 30% yet. Uh, this was the year I started, and I started in January. We don't recommend spring planting of alfalfa. We recommend fall planting. But I started in January, so we spring planted this stand. And you see the benefit, or the benefit, you see the, the uh, negative aspects of that as you look through this data from the yield standpoint, from the quality standpoint. It just took a while for it to catch up, and I don't know that it ever actually does catch up to our fall planted um, time periods. But you'll see that we have this alfalfa and then we start to see the increase of alfalfa production in that fall time period. We let it go through a little bit of a winter rest and starting back in March, now we're, we're really starting to see a great contribution of alfalfa. Now I notice you'll see a lot of other in here. 
Um, that's usually volunteer annual ryegrass, and everybody, I don't know if you all fight it here, but we fight that like crazy. Uh, but as a, as a beef producer, I don't, uh, annual ryegrass is high quality forage. Uh, and then in the summertime periods, it's crabgrass. So again, I'm not arguing too much about that in that particular system. But we continue to see that contribution. We're seeing it greater than that 30%. We didn't have to apply nitrogen in the system, and now we've got us a pretty good mixture. So what, at the end of the three years, what were our results? We said that the advantage in this system goes to the mixture when compared to Bermuda grass alone, obviously not compared to alfalfa production alone, uh, but we saw that we increased the total number of harvests, so we're increasing that unit, uh, the use of that, that unit of land. We increased the tons produced annually, uh, and then we increased our forage quality. Now, a lot of people talk about this, and we ha do have this data in this guide that I'm gonna show you all later, uh, but they talk about this right here, and they say, well, that's not a big improvement. If you remember, we spring planted that. So we didn't have a huge contribution of that alfalfa until later in the year, which then pulled down that quality. But you get into year two and year three. If you're a beef cattle producer, that's rocket fuel. You're not having to add a lot of supplement to that. So that's something to really uh, consider. Our work where we have planted in the fall, these numbers are not uh, as low in that first year. Uh, so that's just something to consider. Uh, another thing, I know we, we're not here to talk about clover, but one of the questions a lot of my producers had is, um, well, what about something else, right? I, I want something else that'll work in the system. We are a crimson clover country, right? South Georgia, we don't plant anything other than Dixie crimson clover and Marshall ryegrass. That's what everybody plants. Uh, so we looked at, well, what, what would be another legume option that could be comparable to our alfalfa Bermuda. So we continued on the plots that we had and we added a red clover, specifically Barduro red clover. It was developed in, uh, in Florida, so it was very close to our environment. And we've been pretty impressed with that. Uh, so I just wanted to mention a little bit uh, about that. We do, uh, I do wanna point out that again, the alfalfa was uh, established in 2016. So this would have been a four and five year old stand of alfalfa that we're doing a comparison uh, among. And so in 2019, you'll see it in all of our data when you go across, it kind of looks like 19 took a dip. Uh, so I blame it on my PhD student that started that year because it rained, rained, rained on his first day in June and it did not rain again at all. At, I mean, at all. So this was, these pictures were taken, this was the establishment year uh, and then this was going into to August. Uh, and so 2019, we had it out there, but there really wasn't, it just wasn't competing. Nothing was growing. If you'll see the Bermuda grass uh, is crunchy in that system as well. Uh, but 2020 was a very different year for all of us, but it was a great forage year. I don't know if you all felt that, but everything grew. Nothing else was going, uh, but everything grew pretty well. So we were pretty impressed with that stand in 2020. This picture is in July, okay? July in Georgia is very hot, very dry, uh, but we had phenomenal uh, phenomenal stands there. When we look at that data, we did see comparable. Obviously, that alfalfa is still uh, providing greater yields. It was comparable in that 2020 season, but now in 2020, that alfalfa has followed general alfalfa trends where it increased for years two and years three, and then it starts to decrease. So it's no different uh, in that standpoint from the alfalfa contribution, and as you would expect in pure alfalfa. Uh, from a quality standpoint, they were not different. And again, we were making rocket fuel at that point. Uh, this actually, uh, pr this picture came from our beef manager and he was super excited. He was like, I want more of this stuff. Uh, the calves are playing king of the bell right now and they were licking it up. So we were pretty impressed uh, with that particular mixture. Uh, and so that was an alternative for our producers or maybe a way for them to ease into production. However, if you have an area that has a lot of clover, know that clover and alfalfa grow at the same time, now you're gonna have a competition effect. So you kinda of wanna pick an area, if you are gonna intercede into Bermuda, that maybe you've not added a lot of clover at some point. Whoop. So the question, it's not gonna be answered. Okay, there we go. All right, maybe it's because it needs some coffee, y'all. Um, so uh, the question that all my producers ask is how long will this last in this particular system? Uh, as I said, we see the growth uh, of the alfalfa system to mimic that of our production system. Um, we did expect that we would have more harvest in 2019. Uh, the, the drought really took that out. 
but we see that we increased our yield in 17 and 18, and then we started to decrease along that trend as alfalfa production. Uh, we have continued this standout in a little bit of a different way because now the next question for us and our producers is what's the next step? Because in pure alfalfa production, you, it's no longer economical, you take it out, you put another crop in, you go back a year later, you put it back in, right? Well, in our system, if you have Bermuda grass, what, at what point do you want to take the alfalfa out or do you adjust the use of that field for a little while and what's the next step? We have done a little bit of preliminary interseeding work. If we have a thin stand, you know, since we have the Bermuda grass in there, is the autotoxicity issue a problem? So far, I would not recommend it. It still, it didn't, it didn't work out well in that system. Uh, and then again, looking at those quality parameters uh, that we had there, we, uh, we again are seeing great improvements in the quality uh, and that's what uh, you know, our, our cattlemen are looking for. Uh, so then the next thing that we ran into, and this is kind of where you know, my heart is, is, is grazing projects and doing grazing research. And so at the same time where we were doing the baleage work, we were also doing a comparison of alfalfa Bermuda grass to uh, Bermuda grass with nitrogen and without nitrogen. Uh, this again was when I started, uh, and so we didn't have our paddocks built yet, so we had a completely temporary system uh, with, these, uh, with this whole system, and we built everything, so we learned a lot about temporary technologies. Uh, and obviously, we're very encouraging to our producers. If you're going to implement rotational grazing, we have lots of tools out there now that are really available and a good resource uh, that we all need to be benefiting from, especially in the current economic times. We've got to stretch our resources, and this is definitely a way that we can do that. Um, so again, in year one was 2018, we had great weather, timely rains, it was, it was a very easy year, even though it was an establishment year, we grazed for 122 days on that system, um, on all three treatments. Uh, year two, again, we started about the same time, but we only made it for 87 days, that's the year it rained in June and then didn't rain uh, anymore. And so. Uh, we were impressed that we made it as long as we did, uh, but we learned a few things in this system that I think we knew, but we you know, have to confirm it sometimes. Looking at the animal gains, uh, a lot of people like to focus on average daily gain. We really don't see that much difference uh, from an average daily gain standpoint. It, that's not the thing that you need to be really focused on. It's when you started looking at stocking rate, uh, and gain per hectare. And so it's not that the individual animals or the, or the average performance of the animal is that much greater. You can have close to the same gains, especially in the middle of the summer, which nothing really gains weight in the middle of the summer, except for maybe me. Uh, but uh, looking at the, the gain per hectare, and really we started to add, we were constantly adding more animals, even in the drought, to, to maintain that mixture that had the alfalfa in there and to get that grazing pressure on there. So that's where the big benefit is, uh, rather than focus on our average daily gain. And then again, from our quality standpoint, now we had the first year in there, but we saw an increase in that quality uh, across the board, which then obviously in turn looks at less uh, supplementation requirement and a little bit of an increase in the animal performance. So while that is different, it's not that different. Uh, this would be per treatment. So this is the stocking rate of, or you're talking about across the, that's the average stocking rate across the, the whole four months uh, on that treatment. Uh, so again, our conclusions at this point uh, followed what uh, Paul Beck and them did. They are, it, this is a viable system that we can, we can definitely consider using for our producers. Obviously, we were looking at it from the nitrogen aspect as well, um, but you're going to have to rotationally graze it, and what we figured out, which we knew, uh, but what we figured out and confirmed is three rotations or a short rotation is not going to be long enough for this system. We have to have that 28 to 35 day interval. Even in a drought year, you have to go beyond that. And so in our particular, in this particular system, we only had three rotations. And so they were coming back by 21 days. Uh, and so we, we made some adjustments there because that drought just, it really took it out. Um, so then other work, now our recent work has confirmed that it works well in a baleage system and it works well, it can be grazed and worked in a grazing system, uh, but what's going to be the best managed practice for alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures for the long term, right? How, what's the best benefit that we can get for our producers? 
Now, admittedly, a lot of our producers are, are multi, you know, they, they do multiple crops. They have multiple times that we have kind of those, those times that they can focus more on the cattle or not focus on the cattle. Uh, you know, Wes and I were talking uh, last night about the differences here is most people have cattle and they do both. Where we're at, cattle are more of a, a second thought, you know, a second time period or, or thing to, to like, it's, it's fun in the winter kind of thing. Uh, so, but we got to figure out how we're going to make this system the best. And so this was a, another project, a NEFA funded project, where we were working with Auburn and the University of Florida, where we actually looked at different defoliation strategies. Uh, it's the only project that's been like this style, or this style. Uh, and so we had locations in Georgia and in uh, Auburn. And so this is a a full, this is 40 acres across through here. So I, I have a big playground that I've created. It's very exciting. Um, but this treatment is a baleage only treatment. This treatment is a grazing treatment where we had four rotations in it. And then we have treatments that were called cut and graze. So it would be dual use or where we go through and we cut at certain time periods and we graze at certain time periods. And so right now in this particular picture, we were during a, a grazing time period, but it's all to see how do we keep that alfalfa a little bit longer, especially if we're gonna benefit from the grazing aspect of it. Um, in this one, we would graze the two and a half acre paddocks. Uh, so a split of that for seven days, so it would allow for a 28 day rest period. Uh, so we, we were able to get back in there on that 28 days. We did not stretch it to the 35 days. We made it through several droughts, barely, but we did make it. Um, again, the baleage harvested at that 10% bloom following the 28 to 35 day uh, interval recommendation with a target moisture of 50%. Uh, uh, then the cut and graze, we did the intervals in there. And then we went to what we call stockpile grazing. And if you know anything about it, does everybody know what stockpile is? Yeah, a few people. Okay, so I did this talk one time and somebody was like, please tell me what stockpile is. Um, the older guys that I work with call it standing hay production, uh, but it's when you would go in and you can use a temporary fence to allow access to an area rather than having to harvest that. And so you let the animals harvest it, but it's gonna be a little bit older maybe than your target of active growing season. Except that in our area, and I said this multiple times and then this year they proved me wrong, we haven't gotten a killing frost to get that stockpile to stop, right? The focus of stockpile is you start six to eight weeks before a killing frost and so that frost shuts it down. So then you have your standing hay. Well, we haven't had a killing frost in South Georgia in seven years until this year, right? <laughs> so I'm telling everybody, we're not even worried about that. Yes, well, we got it this year. Uh, so we have what we're calling target stockpile grazing where we're allowing it to grow. We're using uh, shorter rotations and we're changing the area that the animals can get into, but we're grazing in that fall time period that fits that forage gap for our producers. All right, so this is just to show you again to kind of mimic what we're doing. Um, for the two years of the study, obviously the, the first year we didn't start until May or June uh, just because of the growth. The second year we were able to start um, a little bit earlier in the season. Uh, so for our cut and graze, we do focus on allowing for that summer slump when that alfalfa is to allow the alfalfa to rest. Also looking at our grazing work, we're not seeing a great difference in our average daily gain in the middle of the summer of Bermuda grass compared to alfalfa Bermuda grass. So why don't you let the alfalfa rest, go to that Bermuda grass, and then you can come back to that. And so we've seen the benefit of that in the system. Uh, this again is just kind of showing, this is what active grazing looked like. So this was our seven day grazing. Also for our precision ag people, this was the first time my technician used a light bar uh, and it was late at night. And so we have a perfect example of uh, if you have a skip, it's a perfect skip all the way across the 40 acres that we have in there. So uh, precision ag helps if you know how to use it right. Um, so then we did the stockpile grazing. As we talked about, we had our small areas here that were available um, for access. Very surprisingly, last year, we were able to graze on our Tifton 85 mixture till December, till Christmas. Uh, so we started October 1st and we grazed until Christmas. I did let my student off for Christmas, so. Um, uh, the other caveat for the study specific particularly in Tifton, is we are looking at both Russell Bermuda grass and uh, Tifton 85 Bermuda grass in comparison there. So that's where when you're looking at the data here, we have the TR. Uh, this is the cut treatment for the Russell and the cut treatment for the Tifton 85. So the R is Russell and the, and the Tifton 85 is the T. 
Uh, for the first year, we really didn't see any difference in our length um, between the varieties and all systems we really use for 112 days. It's establishment year, right? We don't want to just hammer it the first year out. So we got off of it uh, right before Thanksgiving uh, and, and we just let it rest uh, for the summer or for the winter. For the second year, now we have those good uh, tap roots, that establishment. We have some drought tolerance and, and some of that really in those, in those systems. And so we started looking at that and we saw that really there wasn't obviously, whoop, wow, this thing does not like me. Um, so we didn't see a difference obviously in our baleage treatments and in the length of the total use there because that's timed, right? That's every, we know we're going to go every four weeks and harvest and we're going to be done with that. Um, when our cut and graze treatments, uh, and then also in our grazing treatments, we did see an extension of the use with the Tifton 85. So this is an active grazing right here. So this is, they started in May and then they grazed to this time point. And we got about a week longer, or a little bit over a week longer in uh, the Tifton 85. Now that's because Russell Bermuda grass, if you know much about Russell, it starts earlier in the season, starts to green up and contribute earlier in the season. When it gets to about September, it's done. It doesn't want you to mess with it. The cows don't want it. Like, it's just, it's pretty done. Not that it doesn't have its fit, but if you're looking at the extension of grazing in that particular system, the 85 was making a greater contribution at that time point, and it really showed up uh, when we're looking at the, uh, the stockpile time period. We have continued this study on, um, and we actually have moved it to a September 1st start date. Uh, we were able to graze through September and October, and we ended mid-November. Again, we got into a drought. We had six weeks of no rain, so that's why we ended it in mid-November. But everybody else was in drought and already feeding hay, and we were still grazing. Uh, the caveat in, again, the Russell system that may be a positive benefit is that those, those cows were, ga were grazing essentially pure alfalfa at that point. Like, it wasn't contributing to it, where in the 85 system it was. So we're real curious to see what those results are going to show. Uh, so then looking at this again, our summary of our grazing data, uh, we did see that we had greater grazing with year two, or in, in year two with our mixtures with our Tifton 85. Um, but we, either way, you're not going to scoff at getting that many days of grazing. Uh, if you're out there and your animals are doing the work for you, that's less time you have to spend on the tractor. Uh, we didn't see a difference really in our average daily gain other than in the cut and graze. Obviously, you're giving them the, the best quality material at that time so they're not having to graze through that summer when it's, it's a little bit lacking on the quality standpoint. Uh, looking at the quality across all the treatments, obviously your best quality is going to be in that baleage system. You are targeting it, you're controlling it, you've got all of the factors in there. Whereas with the grazing system, uh, you're definitely at the mercy of weather and you're out there, right? You're, you're not pulling those animals off and so you're going to see a little bit of fluctuations, but still nothing to scoff at in those systems. All right, so how do we compare these? Uh, so uh, we did what we call a three-way uh, three comparison uh, based on anticipated live weight gain, right? You can't do a live weight gain on baleage, but you can do a, a calculator estimated live weight gain. And so you look at that, everybody's like, I need to be cutting baleage. I mean, that's, that's what that tells you, right? Uh, but what we're looking at is what's going to optimize this system, what's going to be the best for our producers from an optimization standpoint. And that's where we really see that cut and graze system is going to come into that benefit. You can graze or, or cut early in the season when you have that highest quality. You can rest in the summer and then in the winter or in the, in the fall time period when you already have high quality things that they potentially could be grazing. Now you can be, you could be grazing this in that particular system. Sorry, I've got that backwards. In the, in the um, winter, fall, or winter, spring time period, when we have ryegrass and other things that they could be grazing, now you aren't having to feed to them. You are, uh, they're grazing that, and you're making a high-quality feed with your baleage production. That's how we got it set up now. Um, so, again, strategic management in these dual-use systems is probably going to be our best managed practice for producers that are in dual-use uh, in, in environments when they already have the option of doing both. So again, that's where it ran into our next project where we're looking at nutrient preservation, utilization and cycling, because these are all pretty words that we all like to hear and, and they like to hear on grant funding. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we're going through a resting, then we do the spring clean off cut. The first and second baleage harvest, we're looking at the effects of preservatives and inoculants. We have a lot of producers that are looking at the timing of when they apply that and, and they think they're getting a greater drydown or quicker drydown. Our first year results have not determined that there was any change in the drydown time with an early application of that. But obviously we do recommend an inoculant at, at baling. 
Uh, then we go into the summer slump rest. We allow it to rest, and then we start active growth grazing in um, September 1st. On September, and this year we did make it uh, into mid-November, and we're just kind of seeing how far we can make it. Uh, we do rotate these every four days. Uh, we know that alfalfa regrowth starts uh, and once you remove that material within a four-day time period, so we're trying to really maximize on that growth of that alfalfa. So we move, it, we move these animals every four days. Other projects that we have or that we're looking at uh, is restoring grasslands with alfalfa from a sustainability standpoint, uh, where in this particular, the unique aspect of this one is we always spray to control crabgrass. What if we didn't, right? What if we didn't control crabgrass or what if we added crabgrass into that particular mixture? Obviously, from a pasture standpoint, you could have crabgrass in your baleage system, but you're going to work on keeping that a little bit cleaner. Um, but if crabgrass is your weed problem, is it really a weed problem? Uh, we're also looking at isoflavone concentrations uh, in the stability of different legumes in the comparison of the red clover to the alfalfa uh, and just seeing what those differences are. We do that work with the University of Kentucky. Uh, and then again, we're looking at what's, what's the next step for our producers, right? What are they going to do next? Because we have this, all this data that tells us what to do in alfalfa production, but how are we going to manage it in alfalfa and Bermuda grass? So what are the lessons that we've learned the hard way uh, and the things that we want to be sure that we take home from this? Uh, seed depth is of the utmost importance. Uh, too deep, too bad. I'm, I, you know, the number of times I've gone out to a field and it's been my own, okay? The, the number of times that we've gotten out there and they're like, I see something, I see something. And it's like this little, and then it's gone. Uh, and it's because it just got too deep. And with a lot of our forages that we plant, we had to change our mindset because everything is planted very shallow. In this system, if you are using a no-till drill, if you're seeing several seeds on the top of the ground, you've got it deep enough. That's, that's where you need to have it. So it's a quarter inch uh, or less in depth. Uh, one of the questions a lot of producers ask me is Roundup Ready alfalfa worth it in a mixed system? Now, seven years ago when I started, I was like, absolutely not. Why would you pay for that, right? Because the benefit of Roundup Ready is weed control and you have other things in your mixture. Um, I have now came back off of that. Uh, definitely uh, in an establishment year, it is a great benefit, especially with all this annual ryegrass that we have that's going to volunteer, even if you put your pre-emerge in there. Uh, it's definitely worth it from, and in, in the establishment to be able to control uh, some of those competitions and some of that weed. I actually have a producer that he did half his field in non-Roundup Ready alfalfa and half his field in Roundup Ready alfalfa, and he tells everybody, like, this is the one to do. It, it helped it just get going. It's done better. Performance has been better. Yield has been a little bit greater. So, yeah, maybe it is. It's, it's worth it uh, in the, if it works into your system. Don't skimp on potassium. We know that from Bermuda grass production. Obviously, it's very much highlighted in, in this particular system. Your potassium levels start to drop. Your, your quality of your forage drops significantly. Uh, I laugh because everybody likes our pretty pictures. And I'm like, you should come out sometimes. Alfalfa is not always pretty. Like, you, it's going to let you know when something's not working or something's not right. Uh, when in doubt, scout. Okay, so we, when we want to know what our problems are in our field or if we drive by and we're seeing a problem, you're probably a little bit too late. So you need to spend time in your fields. Uh, you know, the biggest issue and one of the reasons that alfalfa production left Georgia uh, is cheap nitrogen sources and uh, the, the alfalfa weevil, right? Uh, and so everybody is, is so concerned about, um, you know, having, uh, having these insect concerns, but the reality is, is pyrethroids control them. It's just timing. Get out in the field, scout. When you start to see that damage, uh, you spray, you've controlled them. So we, we really aren't even that concerned about it anymore. Um, unless you test, it's just a guess. This is obviously uh, true from the standpoint of, of soils as well as forage quality. Uh, and so, you know, these things, they're going to fluctuate throughout the year. So you need to be sure uh, to get those tests and to be sure you're maintaining your system. And the biggest important lesson that we have learned is that alfalfa will, in fact, grow in Georgia. I've been doing it for seven to 10 years because I was kind of working over there a little bit before. Uh, and I have over 100 acres right now of alfalfa and, it, and it's doing well. So it will grow in Georgia. Obviously, we already know that it grows well uh, in Oklahoma. Um, on that, we do have some resources. We have several publications that are available, uh, but I did bring some of these. This was um, a request that we got from a lot of producers is we have alfalfa guides, but we didn't have anything specific to alfalfa and Bermuda grass. Uh, and so the National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance helped to sponsor this so that we would be able to, to do this work. It's a very just straightforward production guide on the system, as well as a production management uh, calendar. Uh, 
uh, with your step-by-step. -step. So if you're thinking about it, you go through and you say, ooh, have I sprayed grays on? Better wait till next year because I'm not going to plant alfalfa in there this year. Uh, but it's a management calendar. Just kind of give you ideas of what you need to be doing. Like it's, it is uh, the month of August. Well, we need to be considering stockpile initiation or whatever it happens to be in this particular thing. So we do have these resources available. Please take them home with you because I'm not going to take them home with me. I already have plenty uh, in Georgia. Uh, and it is a regional effort. So this is not a UGA publication. It's a national publication uh, with contributions from Florida, uh, Alabama, Debs in up north. Uh, so, so a really good publication to have. And with that, I stayed close to time. <laughs> I'm a time stickler. What yes, sir. What about the fertility? How did you did you fertilize during the summer after each bedding? Right. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's very intense. Your Bermuda was very intensely managed. Okay. So. We follow what we would do as our standard recommendations, not that everybody follows the standard recommendations, uh, but we do 300 units of potash across the season, three to 400 units. Uh, we'll do 100 units after every other cutting. So um, in a Bermuda grass system, in the middle of the summer, our guys are, they are supposed to put nitrogen and potash after every cutting or every other cutting. And so since we are stretching this and having, you know, six to eight cuttings versus four, we do it every other cutting throughout the season. Is that? So you're still slowly managing your Bermuda grass, so from a production standpoint, you should be able to get more cuttings out of your Bermuda. Right. Oh, in, in the baleage evaluation, we were surprised with what the, the Bermuda grass yields were. On that one, we, we did add the nitrogen. We did do just like we would follow our standard um, Bermuda grass components. I was surprised in that. I don't, we're not sure if it was compaction or what happened in that particular system. Uh, the advantage of this is if you are managing for the alfalfa, then you in turn are managing the Bermuda grass. Uh, so it works out well there. It's just we, don't, we just don't put that one extra application. But our producers don't do every cutting. They, you know, recommendations say you should, but they don't do every cutting. So, Yes, sir? Right. Right. So two of the things that we did, uh, we actually, and, and we're just, it's just in preliminary standpoint because we're really not sure what the answers are. And a lot of it, we looked at John Jennings' work out of Arkansas and, and had a lot of conversations with him. Um, we tried the interseeding because of the um, 16 inches around the plant. Um, and while we planted on a 14 inch row, if some of that was thinning out, would we see that impact? We did. So that's not going to be the recommendation. So then the next recommendation is how, how far out do you have to kill and how are you going to effectively kill the alfalfa without killing your Bermuda grass component? So that's a whole other aspect there. We, uh, we sprayed at 12, 6, and 3 months. Yeah, 12, 6, and 3, and then the day before. Uh, and we've just planted that. So we're, we're seeing emergence, but emergence doesn't mean anything. It, it's what's going to actually stick around there. Uh, so we are looking at that right now because that's a, a serious question. Yes, sir? Maybe you said this and I just missed it, but how long was your alfalfa, excuse me, your Bermuda established before you put the uh, alfalfa in? In other words, could you spread alfalfa in the spring, come back in the fall the same year mm -hmm. with alfalfa? Um, so we've had producers that do that. We don't recommend that. Um, in our first baleage study, that was a long-term stand. It had been 85 for years. Uh, in the grazing study, the new one that we established, that uh, Bermuda grass had been there two years, uh, and then we added the alfalfa. Um, part of that, and of course, when, especially when you're working with Tifton 85, you gotta, you got to baby it in that first year to get it going. Uh, maybe not a, a jigs or some of the, some of the other the faster spread. Um, but from a weed control and establishment standpoint, we want to be able to get that Bermuda grass good and covered in there before you ever add the alfalfa. So we recommend at least a year from establishment. Uh, so if you planted in the spring or summer of year one, you would go a full year of managing the Bermuda grass. When you have a good stand, then you would go fall of the next year. I use grad students. No, I, actually, I did one time um, with pigweed. But uh, we use pre-emergence. So, and all of this is covered in, in this as well. But um, the best and pretty much your only 
a good herbicide option in a mixture like this, unless you have Roundup Ready in the winter applications, is a pre-emerge. We use Prowl H2O um, three to four times throughout the season. Uh, I know a lot of people are looking at Resilon because it is also a pre-emerge option uh, in Bermuda grass systems. It does not work in the alfalfa Bermuda grass. So we do not recommend that one at this point. So you didn't, you didn't dye your own at all? No, no, we didn't. Um, and some of that is on both sides, um, so, yes, yeah, but we, we didn't, we haven't used it. Um, some of that is uh, one of our former forage specialists didn't like using a dyer on, on Tipton 85, uh, and he was concerned about some of the negative impacts that they have seen, some of the spriggers have seen, uh, and so we just stayed away from that in our system. I'll be around, uh, but everybody take one of these home. Uh, you know, if not, you can wrap Christmas presents with them because they're pretty. There's lots of pictures because uh, so they're not going back to Georgia. So let's give Dr. Tucker a hand. We should carry off the floor. It is live. So uh, pretty excited to introduce the next speaker. Uh, just because he's uh, one of the newest members of the University of Arkansas, he's the new forage fertility specialist for Arkansas, 100% extension. And he comes out of Oklahoma, so we have some good strong ties uh, stretching out there. So Bronk Finch, he started November 28th in Arkansas, or 27th, so he, this is his first out-of-state gig for his new job, and he's kind of come back to Stillwater for a little bit. But Dr. Finch is going to go over some stuff for grass for fertility management, uh, some things we've done here and elsewise. So. Wrong. Point that way to make it go. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Arnell. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't like these. No? Bring it up a little bit. Up a little bit. All right. That's, that's what I need to know. Better? All right. Can, can everybody hear me good? All right. I can kind of hear myself. So maybe if I can hear me, y'all can hear me. Uh, as Dr. Arnell said, I'm a new faculty member for the University of Arkansas Division of Ag. Uh, I'm so new, I don't even have business cards yet. This is my third week on the job. And actually, you all get the, the unfortunate experience of being my first uh, presentation in official capacity. So, with that being said, I apologize in advance if I bore you to sleep or anything of that nature, but I'm excited to be here and excited to talk to you all about Bermuda grass fertility. So as you mentioned, I'm soil fertility, and my program at University of Arkansas is primarily focused on fertility management for uh, pasture and forage production, and we work a lot with Bermuda grass in University of Arkansas. So some of the data I'm going to present to you today comes from Arkansas, but there's also some that I'm going to present that comes from here in the state of Oklahoma, from my time working with Dr. Arnell during my PhD. <clears throat> so one thing when we talk about fertility matter or rather forage management we have to think about is forage systems are often maintained as a low input system as far as cost goes just as any other system but more importantly in forage systems since they are more often a lower output lower return system so whenever we look talk about the fertility management of it that's really important whenever we look at the past couple of years when for fertilizer prices have been through the roof we're looking at, you know, urea is 86 cents per pound of nitrogen. Diammonium phosphate is right around a dollar per pound of P2O5. And potash is 69 cents for a pound of K2O. It's really important when we talk about the fertility management of these, these lower return systems. And then another thing that we really don't have any control over, and I know everybody in this room is probably tired of hearing about as well, and that's the drought. The drought has been exceptionally bad this past year, and I was here in Oklahoma for it. Whenever I got to Arkansas, they keep talking about the drought, but I've been there three weeks and it hadn't stopped raining, so I guess it's relative, but the drought is one thing that we can't control, and we really kind of have to adjust our management when we look at these forage systems to really take advantage of that rainfall when we do get it. And now, moving forward, when we think about when we will get that rainfall, it doesn't look like it might get any better. There's a chance that it might get better. There's a chance that it might get worse, but it's really kind of looking like for Arkansas and much of Oklahoma, it might kind of stay the same, maybe get with the chance of potentially getting a little worse, but we can always hope for the best. So that's what we'll do. We'll hope for the best 
and we'll work on the management of the fertility side. So how do we do that? Well, this next slide I, I borrowed from Dr. Brian Arnell, and I'd say he probably made this slide famous. I don't know. We call this the soil fertility ladder, and I'm going to lean on the soil fertility ladder for this. Uh, for forage management across the board, I'd like to think that it's good to take it to a back-to-basics approach with the soil fertility ladder and start at the bottom and make sure that we're, we're addressing these things in an in a order that we are being efficient with our application and conscientious with our fertilizer management. So as I said, everybody's probably seen this before, but if you haven't, you start at the bottom with your soil testing and you work up one rung at a time to soil pH, P and K, and then finally nitrogen and secondaries and micros. Now I'm not gonna talk too much on the secondary and micros because we really, at least for me, as I focus on uh, my career, I'm not going to start out with managing those secondaries and micros. I wanna make sure that the P and K and the pH are really managed properly and that we're managing nitrogen on the go. So without further ado, we'll jump right into it. Soil testing. I'm sure everybody in here is good at soil testing. There's a soil sampling, knows how to take a representative uh, sample. We want to take that sample to a depth of, of six inches to represent that active rooting zone. But take, take in mind in some of these drier years, you know, I'm sure everybody's had, had some trouble putting a soil probe in the ground in a drier year. You might not be able to get six inches, you can get four or five something of like that, just take that into account. If you're not able to get that six inches and you can get a four inch or a five inch sample, when you look at that soil test result, remember that those are going to be reported oftentimes on a six inch depth. While you took a five inch depth, that's gonna kind of skew your results and will need a little bit of adjustment. So, so take that into account in those dry drier times if you can't get that zero to six inch depth Make sure you're just getting a representative sample, even if it's down to four, and then adjust your, your recommendations based upon that. And then for surface residue, um, in, in any cropping system, we often recommend removing surface residue before you sample. For Bermuda grass systems and many forage systems, I highly recommend that, especially in these drier years, because those systems will have a lot of organic matter there on the surface, some, some uh, leftover residue from the last cutting, something of like that. And you don't want to make sure you don't get that in your soil sample because that could attribute nutrients to your soil that might not actually be there in drier years when that organic matter may not be broken down and mineralized. So just make sure you clear off the spot before you take the sample. It's just a little bit added step, a good swipe with the foot can do it. And this quote right here, I like this quote. This comes from one of my counterparts at University of Arkansas. Uh, Lime and fertilizer recommendations are only as good as the sample that's collected from the field. So make sure we're getting a good representative sample so that those recommendations match the field that we're, we're looking at. So moving from soil testing, we move into soil pH as the next rung on that ladder. Now this is just a series of tables that I got from Texas A&M uh, University that show the pH ranges for varying forages of interest. Today we're just going to focus on that Bermuda grass uh, pH, which is a pretty good range, 5.5 5 to an 8.0 uh, pH. We're going to focus on that one. Um, so when you're thinking about soil pH and you, you get your test back and you look at it and you, you see you are potentially below that 5.5 level and you want to consider adjusting your pH. These two tables are data from here in Oklahoma in an intensively managed Bermuda grass system, which was, is managed intensively for a, a multi-harvest quality uh, Bermuda grass, and then a non-intensively managed system, which is really just managed for potentially multiple harvests, but at least one harvest of just good biomass uh, Bermuda grass hay. In neither one of these systems did we really see an influence of any products that are said to adjust pH compared to hydrated lime put out at two tons, per e two tons of ECC per acre. Some of these other products say that they can adjust pH of the soil similar to that hydrated lime with less product, less cost. That may not always be the case, so take that into account when you start to see some of these products come up and really just do a little research, do a little digging and see what See if there's data out there that really shows that 
and how much is that cost saving? How much will you need to apply to get to what you can do with hydrated lime? So just be conscientious as you think about some of those products that are advertised to be able to do something such as adjust uh, soil pHs. Now in neither one of these years did we have a response of Bermuda grass yield to pH range and that I really don't have an answer for but as I move on into the future I really want to address kind of why we're not seeing that response to pH when we get into those lower pHs of like a 4.3, 4.4. Another thing interestingly that I learned just this past week um, is that soil pH is very, very, varies throughout the season, which I kind of knew that, but whenever you get in those hotter, drier times, you can really see that, that soil pH start to decrease compared to the average of the field. This is some data from 1972 uh, on a Dundee, Dundee silt loam that shows that in those drier times that pH can drop up to uh, 0.3 units. So when you, when you think about that and you take that soil sample and you get that soil pH, really consider where you're at and where you could be if you have that, that 0.3 pH change in those drier times. You think about June, July, when we're getting maybe that first, second cutting and that brumetta grass is trying to come back. What is that soil pH going to be then when it's really already kind of up against a wall trying to recover from a cutting? So just take that into consideration whenever you're looking at those uh, soil samples. And take into consideration, obviously, hot and dry for all the nutrients, as some, work, some recent work done in Arkansas shows that all soil nutrient uh, results can vary when soil is dry and hot. So, enough about pH. We know that we need to adjust pH. The bigger question I get is phosphorus and potassium, and really mostly potassium, but I want to hit both of them because they're the next rung on that ladder. The first portion of the data I'm going to talk about really kind of couples them together. And then whenever I get to some of the data, some of the more recent data from Arkansas, we kind of separate them apart and manage them separately. So in Oklahoma, from the South Central Research Station down in Chickasha, from an eight-year Bermuda grass trial that Dr. Arnell conducted, observations of only, ad, uh, only numerical additions to yield were observed by adding P compared to just using nitrogen alone. These, this phosphorus was added at 12 pounds of P2O5 per ton of, of Bermuda grass hay yield as recommended by the state of Arkansas. Um, we saw a 400 pound increase by that addition, but it wasn't really statistically different from just increasing that nitrogen up to 150 or beyond 150 pounds per acre. But when we look at adding phosphorus and potassium, then we really start to see that influence, that, that difference. We see we get the highest yield of two and a half tons per acre on average over the eight years from adding P and K, which was 24% greater than when we just added phosphorus alone and 38% greater than when we added just nitrogen. So really what we see here is, is a, a potassium limitation that might be masking some of the, P, some of the phosphorus limitations as well. Unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to really evaluate those limitations individually. Moving forward, Dr. Arnell has, uh, and I actually got the opportunity to be a part of this study as well, re kind of reevaluated the P and K requirements for Bermuda grass. Now, the, these next two short uh, snippets of data that I'm going to talk about are on the same intensively and non-intensively managed fields that I, I spoke about earlier. And what we see in the non-intensively managed field, we see an increase of Bermuda grass really to be only come from nitrogen. There were slight observations of P and K on this field, but really here we only see the nitrogen addition being beneficial. But when we look at that more intensively managed for multiple high quality cuttings, that's when we see the influence of the P and K rates, where they have the greatest influence on yield at one and a half times soil test recommended value. So when we're applying P and K one and a half times greater than what the soil test requires, we're starting to see some of that influence of those additions. So that, that made me kind of question, well, what, where is that influence coming from? And what are we, what's being done in Arkansas to address this? So we got to I got to looking and I found some <clears throat> soil test reports from, or, or a collection 
of data from soil test reports out of the Mariana Soil Testing Lab in Arkansas, which is a soil testing lab that all producers uh, get the opportunity to send their soil samples to. And uh, pastures and, and ground, ground focused for forage and pasture production really shows that soil pH of the samples submitted was really in an, in an adequate to optimal range and phosphorus was also at an optimum or above optimum range for 60% of the samples collected. Okay, so we know that P and K are really important, or phosphorus is really important, but what, what's the problem in Arkansas? And that is potassium. When we look at the same soil, soil tests, we see that 58% of the soil tests that were submitted in 2020 fall below the, the low, fall into the low or very low category for soil test potassium, meaning that there's been a lot of a lot of hay removed and not a lot of management of that potassium on those soils. That has the added effect of influencing the forage yield and quality of the system, and it's going to require some management to to mitigate and get to a level where we're no longer uh, seeing that negative influence. So how do we manage it? Well, a study that has been conducted for the past several years um, and has established as a, as a two location study evaluating the removal and forage yield response to P and K uh, for phosphorus and potassium fertilization at the Fayetteville and Batesville location like I said, was established in 2019 and is conducted by one of my counterparts there at the University of Arkansas. We actually resubmitted this to the Soil Test Review Board for additional funding for the next couple years. These, these are two separate trials that are evaluating phosphorus and potassium separately but side by side at both of these locations. Evaluating both P and K at incremental rates of 30, 60, 90, 120, and 150 with split applications of anything above 60 pounds per acre. So 60 split into two, 90 split into three, everything above 90 is split into three equal applications for both P and K. And these split applications are made at first green up, the first application for all of them are made at first green up, and the split applications are after the first and after the second harvests. So from this trial, what we see is when we look at the phosphorus response to, or when we look at the Bermuda grass response to phosphorus, we don't really see in the overall system from, and this is just data from the 2021 growing season, the overall system don't really see a response to phosphorus. And as I, I forgot to mention, I'll, I'll back up here, at the Batesville location, we see a low soil test K and medium to low soil test phosphorus as compared to the Fayetteville location where we have low soil test K, but we have an above optimum soil test phosphorus. That plays into importance. I don't know if I'm talking into that microphone too. Uh, that plays into importance at the Batesville location where in that final harvest, we actually see a little bit of influence of soil tests or, or of phosphorus applications rather, where we can see that the addition of at least 30 pounds of phosphorus gets us into the same uh, similar range as any of the other additions, but whenever we get up to about that 90 pound application rate, we're really setting ourselves aside, or set, setting ourselves apart from when we're not applying at all. So when we get into those medium to low soil test le phosphorus levels, really ought to consider just applying some phosphorus to really pump up that yield, uh, even though we may not see it see a response in the overall uh, the overall yield of the the system we might see it in one of those individual cuttings where there could be a response such as we saw at the, uh, the Batesville location at, at both of these locations like I said the Fayetteville location the response was pretty flat we didn't really have a, a uh, <clears throat> increase anywhere but at the Batesville location we started to see that we hit 95 percent relative yield right around the uh, 67 pound per acre P205 rate. So at that 95% relative yield, we're, we're right around statistically, we would be the same as the highest yield of any of the applications there 
across the three years of this trial. So at that, 95, that, that 67 pound rate, we're kind of achieving our max yield. When we look at the change of soil test phosphorus, what we see is at the Batesville trial, we saw, or at the Fayetteville trial rather, we saw an increase in soil test phosphorus to application rate. But whenever we look at the lower end, the lower soil, or the lower application rate and the checks, we actually see a decrease in uh, soil test P, which equals less nutrient, which has equaled less nutrient removal of phosphorus in that Bermuda grass. So it's really whenever we're, we're below op, or we're not applying or we're, we're below a optimal level of application, we're starting to mine some nutrients out of the soil there with that phosphorus but it's, it's also impacting the phosphorus removal by that Bermuda grass because it's not available. <clears throat> so next up is Bermuda grass response to K. So we talked a little bit about phosphorus and we saw that phosphorus can be kind of, phosphorus can be kind of <clears throat> set at a, a level and really managed with a single application. Potassium on the other hand is a little different when we look at this past year's uh, Bermuda grass yield to response to uh, phosphorus fertilization, what we notice is that at both of these locations, we have kind of a curvilinear and quadratic response to potassium. That means with each incremental addition of potassium, we're getting an incremental increase in yield to a certain point, and then we start to decrease. That point shows up in all, whenever they look at the eight site years of the K trial that has been done, looking over the eight, eight site years, they see that area lands right around 200 and, I want to say it's about 212 pounds of K2O per acre. That's where we're reaching that 95% relative yield, which like I said, that's really not going to be different from our highest yields. What's more interesting to me on that is that at that 95% uh, relative yield, we're kind of at that the, similar to the highest yield we can get, we see that we're still having removal and we're still having some response out on those higher rates, but that removal has become luxury removal. So it, that Bermuda grass is still removing it, but it's really not increasing our yield all that much. It's not increasing it statistically, and in some cases it's actually lower than where we're at with that, our max yield. So we want to kind of avoid that. At, at the 2021 Batesville trial, there, it was noted that there was 36 and 47 pounds removed by the, at those higher rates that, and no influence on yield. <clears throat> so when we look at the change in the soil test for, for potassium, what we can see is similar to phosphorus, we see just that steady increase. So it's almost linear increase in soil test K with increasing application. Well, whenever we look at that, those low to no applications, we really start to see a major influence of soil test or soil mining of that Bermuda grass to really get that, that K out of the soil, which results in lower, uh, lower uptake of, Bermuda, of K in the Bermuda grass and really compromising the yield <clears throat> of that forage and really compromising some of the quality, especially in these drier years when K is really important for some, some model conductance and, and some drought tolerance of, of crops. So we really want to make sure that we're not depleting the soil of K, but also that we're having enough K there for that uh, Bermuda grass to take up and utilize while avoiding that luxury consumption. So when we to tell you all that data to really kind of wrap it up with this. When we, when we talk about the P and K removal for Bermuda grass at a per ton rate, we are able to narrow it down to about 15 pounds of phosphorus removed per ton of Bermuda grass hay. So if you're in a four to six ton hay system, you're looking at about 60 to 90 pounds of P205 that that Bermuda grass is gonna remo remove. So you can really kind of address that, that uh, with an addition of P205 there of about 15 pounds per, per ton, really <clears throat> making sure that you have enough in your soil. But when we look at K, we notice that it's not exactly the same for K. 
while some of the previous recommendations might have been just a flat rate, it's, uh, I think uh, what I saw before was 46 pounds per ton. That's not actually the, the sorry, I just went blank. That's not actually the, the, what's happening here. We see that at a 225 pound rate, we're getting 52 pounds per ton of Bermuda grass, or ton of uh, 52 pounds of K2O removed per ton of Bermuda grass hay. <clears throat> and that kind of changes with our soil test and with our application. Because well, like I said, we can get into some luxury consumption of that Bermuda grass on that K. So for that same four to six ton per acre, four to six ton Bermuda grass yield, we're needing about 200 to 300 pounds of K2O to equal that same rate of, at 52 pounds per acre. So this is an ongoing trial and it was really started to kind of evaluate the Bermuda grass yield response and really that removal rate response to fertilizer applications on varying soil tests or on, on a couple location uh, in Arkansas. And we're continuing this to really kind of narrow down those removal numbers and get a good recommend, uh, uh, I don't want to say a good, uh, to improve upon our recommendation for nutrient removal of P and K for Bermuda grass. But this last little bit on P and K I wanted to show is just the long-term effects of K, uh, uh, K fertilization, or should I say, not fertilizing for K, where the, the blue arrows are those non-fertilized plots, which in the third year of the trial got down to 40, 49 pounds or parts per million potassium soil, soil test, soil test potassium, <clears throat> which I find that quite interesting. I wouldn't expect to see a visual response like that of potassium, but that shows that there is some influence, there, there is a lot of influence of making sure that our potassium is where we need to be. While when you look at the phosphorus, you really can't see those checks. And you start to see some of those Bermuda grass symptoms. So pay, watch for those Bermuda grass, uh, those, sorry, not Bermuda grass, potassium deficiency symptoms. Watch for those, those deficiency symptoms if you're at that lower, lower end of K levels. So finally, the last step that I'm really going to talk about on that soil test letter, and that is nitrogen. Everybody hear me? Nope. All right. Okay. Everybody hear me all right now? Okay. So <clears throat> nitrogen, this is some of that data that come from the South Central Research Station, the Chickasha trial, eight-year study. And, and this data really, this first section is just going to focus on evaluating that source. The difference between using urea and ammonium nitrate. We know that urea is readily available, but ammonium nitrate is pretty, a pretty good source for and we're in, in instances where we have, we're susceptible to some losses. Well, we notice at the 50 pound per acre rate, we really don't have a difference between the two sources. But there was more yield produced per unit of nitrogen by, the, by using urea with 45 pounds of Bermuda grass produced per pound of <clears throat> uh, nitrogen as urea compared to 41 pounds for the ammonium nitrate. But when we get up to that 100 pound per acre rate, what we see is an 800 pound increase in yield from using ammonium nitrate in comparison to urea. So it kind of flip-flopped and it really flip-flopped when you look at the yield per unit of nitrogen where we had an eight pound increase in yield per unit of nitrogen by using ammonium nitrate in comparison to urea. Now, like I said, this is some, this is eight years, eight years of data that started in 2013 and I want to say ended in 2021. S some more recent stuff from Arkansas that really compares nitrogen sources for Bermuda grass over a total of four harvests. <clears throat> this comes from, like I said, comes from Arkansas. We really don't see a major response or a difference between urea and ammonium nitrate, urea and ammonium nitrate in either common Bermuda grass or uh, hybrid Bermuda grass in this, this one year of data. We do see in the common Bermuda grass some influence of using 
MVPT versus Anvil, uh, we, we see a decrease on using the those compared to ammonium nitrate to kind of mitigate some losses. This trial, however, didn't really have an opportunity for some major losses where each time this nitrogen was put out, shortly thereafter, it was reined in. So there really wasn't a conducive opportunity for really evaluating that influence of some of those uh, loss inhibitors and, and comparing urea to ammo uh, ammonium nitrate. <clears throat> this is just one year of data, and I hope to actually kind of address some of this moving forward because that has been a big question is what's the loss difference, you know, what's, what's the difference between ammonium nitrate and urea? What, I, what I'm going to really focus on is kind of that dollar value and that, that distance. You know, how available is ammonium nitrate? Even if it might be a little more efficient, you might be a little more susceptible to losses with urea. Is it cheaper and how, how, how available is it compared to urea? If it's, if it's not, if urea is cheaper, you can maybe add a little bit and, and accept a little bit of loss of that urea. So that's just some of the stuff moving forward that I want to focus on as I've been asked a lot about this comparison between urea and ammonium nitrate. <clears throat> when we look at rate from that same trial at Chickasha, we notice that with urea, we get a 600 pound per acre increase in dry matter production just by doubling the rate from 50 to 100 pounds. Now for urea, 100 pounds was as high as that trial, as high as the, the nitrogen rate went for that trial. For ammonium nitrate, however, we did increase all the way up to 200 pounds in incre increments of 50. What was observed was an increase of 1,600 pounds per acre of dry matter when 100 pounds or more nitrogen was applied at this location, getting us to about two, you know, two ton per acre. But as I mentioned before, this location was really limited by P and K. So we don't really know that where our highest point of response can be for nitrogen because we're at that P and K limitation. Is this a irrigated trial or dry land? Dry land trial. So water can be your limiting factor as well. That is true. That is a good point. I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Water can be a limit, limiting factor as well, <clears throat> especially in these drier years. Thank you for that. Um, but in, in this trial specifically, we did see that K limitation with that, that data earlier. Uh, at the University of Arkansas, the recommendation for nitrogen or Bermuda grass hay is about 50 pounds per ton. <clears throat> so for two ton, 100 and increasing incrementally. And once you get to about that, that two ton or greater, really want to look at splitting that application with an application at green up and then splitting equal parts uh, throughout the season. And so with all of this, I take it back to this, the, the Liebig's law of the minimum, which states that the yield of a crop, any crop, is limited by the nutrient lowest in the environment. <clears throat> so whether it's water, whether it's P, whether it's K, nitrogen, some of those things, so make sure, I, I recommend making sure that your, your P and your K and your micros are not limiting so that you can take advantage of those rainfall opportunities when they happen, especially in these drier years. <clears throat> so everybody wants to know what's it worth. So let's, let's kind of shift gears just a little bit as I wrap up here. The nutrient value of hay. This data here comes from 2013 from Dr. Slayton. And it really shows that hay, a four by, four by five round bill of hay, <clears throat> is right around $150 per ton uh, for Bermuda grass. And I spoke to uh, one of the economists earlier in the week and mentioned that that price really hadn't changed that much. Uh, four, four by five round bills were going for about $65 uh, per bill. So when we think about that and we look at historical fertilizer prices, fertilizer prices from that same year, we're looking at these, at, at our recommendation rates, uh, $57 per ton of Bermuda grass required $57 of input per ton of Bermuda grass produced. When we look at this year, uh, this data comes from September, we actually see that that number increased up to $89 per ton of Bermuda grass produced. That's a $32 increase 
in production cost without a major increase in return. So that's really important in making sure that you're able to manage that fertilizer so you're getting every dollar that you can get, you're, you're utilizing every dollar that you put in, especially with this increase, with only minimal increases in returns. So with that, just some take homes that, that I wanna hit on. Um, soil test routinely and representatively. Make sure that you're getting that, that active root zone, you're getting a representative sample so that your fertilizer and lime recommendations are representative as well. Ensure that your nutrients and pH levels are adequate. Suboptimal P and K have been shown to really, uh, really hurt yield. And avoid that luxury K consumption. Make sure that you're not over applying and you're, you're not losing dollars just by that Bermuda grass taking it up. That can be done by split applying that K in a similar fashion to how we manage nitrogen. And then for nitrogen, just, just take advantage of the rainfall. <clears throat> Have an on-the-go management for nitrogen, and you can kind of bring in that K application, those K management strategies into that on-the-go management for nitrogen as well. So with that, just a couple uh, resources here. The Wayne, uh, Wayne Sabe Soil Fertility Studies uh, Annual Review comes out once a year, looks like it comes out in May, around May. This will have the continuation of the trial that I presented here, as well as some additional soil fertility studies. And then the Oklahoma Forage and Pasture Guide, which Dr. Arnell and I'm sure many of the county offices have available. It's also available online using that fact sheet number there. Those are both good resources if you're curious about more management of Bermuda grass. So with that, uh, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. As I mentioned, I don't have any, uh, or, or I'm, I'm new, so I don't have any business cards at this time. So there's my contact information. If you have any questions in the future, feel free to reach out. Did you correlate any of your studies to feed value from undergrad versus just expect studies? Not, not at this point, no. It has not been done. Um, that is, I am interested in doing that. I, uh, I just got on, so, so the Arkansas data, I haven't even really seen beyond just the little bit that I've, I used here. And the long-term Bermuda grass data, we didn't always get quality uh, reports on it. So correlating it to feed value was not always an opportunity. So. No, but I do, I do hope to do some of that in the future. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Bronco. Yeah. Okay, and our last speaker of the session, and remember, so the QR code that will come up after this is for the CCAs. There is no more ODAF, so it's just CCAs for the rest of the day, but our next speaker, uh, I appreciate her coming in, kind of a last minute notice getting Elena in, but you know, apparently she does well because she won some money yesterday in the poster contest. But, but with that, excited to have Elena Gerhardt here. She worked on these projects in her master's program. She's now doing a PhD in OSU livestock side. So with that, Elena. Not, but can you guys hear me okay? Oh, there you go. How about that? Yeah, that's better. All right. So, as Dr. Arnall said, um, my name is Elena Gerhardt, and I did my master's in plant and soil science. And then I switched gears and I moved over to the dark side, as they say, and I'm getting my PhD um, in ruminant nutrition here at OSU. Um, so, I want to share with you a little bit of my master's project on reduced lignin alfalfa. So. In order to fully appreciate what reduced lignin alfalfa is, we need to start at a cellular level. Um, so looking at the digestibility aspect, we kind of have two components. We have the cell contents, so that's your proteins, your um, organic acids, all of that stuff is highly digestible. And then we have the cell wall, which is the problem child. And it's gonna be composed of three major pieces, your lignin, your hemicellulose and your cellulose. And sadly, um, those are not very digestible or not digestible at all um, when we look on it 
at an animal perspective. So as you can see here we have um, the problem child and it's composed of our lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose. And this is a little bit confusing at first because um, hemicellulose and cellulose are slightly digestible. However, it's bound up in the lignin and the lignin can prevent um, the animal from actually breaking it down and getting any use out of it. So a great way to look at it is like rebar and cement. So the first thing that you do when you build is you put rebar down and then you come back in a little later and you fill it in with cement. So um, lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose are a lot like that. We first put down the hemicellulose and cellulose when the plant starts to grow. We come back a little later and we fill it in with lignin. Um, so lignin content is going to be a little higher in older plants. It's going to be higher in parts of the plant that are at the bottom where it first grew. Um, so that's where we're going to see our greatest amount of lignin. So here is another example of kind of how, you know, you start from the bottom up. You got your cellulose, your hemicellulose, and your lignin, um, where you see the concrete. And then up at the top, maybe, we have our cellulose and lignin. So it's going to be a little bit more digestible at the top, where it's a little bit more um, vegetation stage. Um, and it's going to be a little bit more available to the animal that's going to break it down. So again, looking at this, we have it broken into our cell content and then our cell wall. And if you look at your cell content, the lowest of digestibility is about 90%. And then you come down to your cell wall, and it's about 30 to 70 for your hemicellulose and cellulose, and you have no digestibility for lignin. Um, so that's part of a plant that you're going to be feeding to your livestock that is of no value to you. So if we could find a way to have even less lignin in our plants, um, it's actually beneficial to you as producers um, because you're going to be able to feed your livestock a nutrient or, that will break down and will be of value to your livestock. Um, so up in the Midwest, they started looking into that and they found two really good ways of reducing lignin. The first way is just like your Roundup Ready, they're going to go in and they're going to genetically modify it. Um, that tends to be the more um, preferred way of getting a lower lignin. There have been a couple companies that have focused at low lignin varieties and have bred it so that way um, you're going to get a little bit lower lignin. However, it's not as successful as if you are going to go in and genetically modify it. Um, so with that coming on the market, one of the first studies was done in Minnesota. Um, and they looked at one reduced lignin alfalfa variety and compared it to three others. Um, and they just wanted to look at it on a production level of quality and yield. Um, but they also wanted to see how it, you know, um, performs under different harvest strategies. So we're going to talk about that really quickly before we get to some of my results. And as you can see on the top, um, that's crude protein, and it maintains similar values to the three um, conventional varieties that were genetically similar. And then coming down to your neutral detergent fiber. So that's a measurement of all of those indigestible components your um, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin are all um, calculated in that. And it was found to be lower because you're removing part of that lignin. So that's great. They're getting really good results. Then dropping down to your acid detergent lignin, they are seeing um, significantly different or lower results from your lignin. Um, so overall, they see it as a great success. Um, now, when you have reduced lignin, you're going to see an increase in digestibility on your animal side. So they measured um, NDF digestibility or neutral detergent digestibility and they were seeing anywhere from 7 to 15 percent greater digestibility in the reduced lignin varieties. Um, that's great because you're getting about 15 percent more use out of the feed that you're feeding your livestock. Um, one concern that they did have is lignin is a structural component so by removing it are we going to see um, you know, some issues with yield, stand, and they did find in a few of the seven site years um, to be a little bit lower. Um, some of them were statistically different, but in the second year there was only one location where it was lower. So altogether it's holding its own against um, varieties that were already going to be growing um, and using on a regular basis. Um, so not of great concern 
they saw great, great results with this, and it's highly recommended and used. Um, but they did want to take the results that they got and kind of help people understand um, how it's going to be of use or how it's going to perform. So they developed a model to show you, um, if you look at the red, that's your reduced lignin alfalfa yield um, on the y-axis, and then the red, or the, the blue is um, like your reference cultivar, a cultivar that you would already have in the field. And they did see that, you know, it is a little bit slightly lower, however, it does overlap, so it might be on the lower producing end, but overall not bad. Um, looking at a similar graph, but using forage, um, relative forage quality, it consistently maintained a higher um, quality across um, the regrowth period. So it is increasing the quality, the digestibility, um, everything that it was marketed to, to be. Um, so they kind of came up with a couple of different ways to use reduced lignin alfalfa. The first is um, really demonstrated by this graph. Here on the y-axis, we have either the percent of maximum yield or quality, and then days of regrowth. So it's um, commonly con known and considered as uh, about 35 days is your highest yield right here. Um, so alfalfa yield will increase, and then as it starts to flower and senesce, we are going to see a little bit of a drop, but over time it does um, tend to increase. However, with the inverse of that, we see alfalfa quality, um, which drastically decreases over time. We see really high uh, quality, but no one's going to come in and harvest at 10 days of regrowth. That's just not going to happen. Um, but when we typically want to harvest to maximize yield, we see um, it on the lower end of quality. However, we just saw that reduced lignin alfalfa quality is maintained higher than your traditional varieties. So we do see that it doesn't um, drop as much, and it's going to maintain its quality over time. Now, there are a couple different methods of using this. So you can either um, continue to harvest at your traditional mark of 35 days, and you're going to receive a higher, lignin, or a higher quality for your reduced lignin varieties. Um, so you don't change your management practice, but you're receiving something in return. Um, it's a little bit of a payback for using reduced lignin alfalfa. Or, um, and you can see that you're still not losing any yield, but you're going to maintain your, um, you're going to increase your quality. So the second approach is that you, you might, you might not care about your quality, but maybe you're a producer who isn't great about the timing of harvest. You know, you have eight million other things to do, and well, shoot, it's just not going to happen this week. That's okay. Um, another management practice is to delay your harvest by about a week, and you're going to maintain your quality and still get the same amount of yield um, with a reduced lignin alfalfa. Um, so you can kind of use it as a time-saving measure, or if you have weather, you're not going to have that loss of quality like you would have seen in your traditional cultivars. So uh, this project is what brought me to Oklahoma. I'm actually from the Midwest, and we grow a lot of alfalfa up there. Um, and we are lucky to be in this area, which is green, where we receive more annual rainfall than total evapotranspiration on an annual basis. However, I moved to good old Oklahoma, where there is part of the state where we receive less annual rainfall um, than we have in total evapotranspiration. So um, we know that these cultivars, which are um, in the, the yellow stars where they've been tested, we know they perform really well up there. But we don't know how the, these cult cultivars are going to perform in locations that have limited annual rainfall, um, like these three sites here. So uh, when looking at Oklahoma alfalfa production, we see a lot of dry land alfalfa happening on the uh, west side of I-35, which if you look back at this map, oh look, it's red. So um, that's kind of the thought behind this project. And we wanted to kind of answer questions on all different types of management um, practices. So we designed our project to have four replications of three different harvest intervals. 
So the 28-day harvest interval uh, would typically be like your high quality. Um, dairies would typically use about a 28-day, maybe a little earlier. Um, and then you would have your 35-day, which is kind of like your sweet spot. You're still maintaining um, quality and you're still getting a higher amount of yield. Um, your 42-day might just be you happen to have a field of alfalfa and you know management isn't your favorite thing to do for that. So you're gonna do a 42-day harvest interval. You're gonna get a little bit more biomass on each of those yields or those harvests. Um, and you might, not, you might not care about the quality. Um, saves on the number of harvests that you have in a summer. So you know it saves on fuel across the field, all that stuff. Um, within each of those harvest intervals, we then had four varieties, very similar to the, re the research project that I just men mentioned about Minnesota. Um, we had our um, reduced lignin alfalfa variety, which I'll refer to as HVX. And then we had three genetically similar um, cultivars that were as close as we could get without being reduced lignin. So in this project, we also took soil moisture um, readings, plant height, uh, and then biomass clippings, as well as quality, which is what I'll be talking to you today about. So we're gonna see several of these graphs and I just wanna set them up really quick for you. So when you see the green, yellow, and red graphs, we're gonna be talking about harvest interval. It can get a little bit confusing. So I first wanna to talk to you um, about our acid detergent lignin. This is why we're here, because it's supposed to be reduced lignin, so is it doing what it says it's gonna do? Um, so on a 28-day harvest interval, uh, we did see that typically it did uh, produce the least amount of lignin on a 28-day harvest interval and the most on a 42. That's not uncommon, that's what we expected to see. Now when you see this, these colors of graphs, we're gonna be talking about cultivars. The blue is our reduced lignin, and then the other three bars are um, our reference cultivars, the three traditionally found um, varieties. So you would expect to see a huge difference in the Harv Extra or HVX variety when compared to the other three, and we really only saw those results in one of our sites um, in both 2020 and 2021 in La Homa. Um, now, this was a little disappointing to me. I moved all the way down here to look at this great technology and we're not even seeing that big of a decrease. Um, now this can be due to the fact that um, lignin can actually be um, accumulated at a lower rate during drought stress. So in still water, we saw more drought uh, stress symptoms, which is why we believe that it kind of lowered those levels back to um, what you would see at the reduced lignin. So we're not seeing a huge difference there. Um, but again, this is a pretty young stand so that it might make a little bit more of a difference. Uh, there is a third year of data that is coming, which I haven't seen yet. Um, so it'll be really interesting after this year to see if those followed um, the same path after being severely drought stressed this year. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk to you about is crude protein. And again, we're back to the harvest intervals, and you would typically see a higher crude protein in your 28-day and a little bit lower values in your 42. And that's what we saw. Um, and overall, that wasn't overly concerning to us. Now, getting to our varieties, we see a little bit of a peak here in um, our HVX variety or our reduced lignin variety, and that gets some people really excited. However, it's kind of a false phenomenon. It's due to the dilution effect. So it's like having whole milk and skim milk, and you have more because it's concentrated in the same volume in the whole milk, more protein. And then you have your regular variety or your skim milk, and it's a little bit diluted. Um, so that is known to the dilution effect, and that can be a little bit difficult to understand. Um, so I have a graph here. We're taking some of our lignin out, um, so it looks, like we are gonna increase our crude protein when we go back up to the full 100% of the whole um, like cell contents and hemicellulose. However, it's, it's not really greater, it's just a different dilution. Um, so don't let that convince you to buy reduced lignin alfalfa, just look at if they're reporting on a pounds per acre basis, which you might see a difference, um, but don't look directly at the percentage. 
Um, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is our above ground dry matter. And you would typically assume that you're going to see a quite a bit um, greater amount accumulated in your 42 day. Um, and we did see that in both site locations um, for the first year of 2020. However, in 2021, we see our 35 day harvest interval to be the greatest. Now, this is kind of a payoff because in some years it will have more and other years it won't. So in 2021, we were able to get one additional harvest of the 35 day harvest interval in. It was a late um, season cutting and we had gotten a rainfall right, right at the perfect time and we were able to just accumulate a little bit more. Um, our 42 day harvest interval unfortunately didn't receive a good rainfall. So that's why we're not seeing um, it as the greatest um, accumulation of biomass. Um, so back to our um, cultivar and varieties here. Uh, the Harv Extra does show to be a little bit lower in three of the four site years um, and not in the fourth site year of Stillwater 2021. Um, again, that could be due to the fact that it, it's a little bit lower on the end of cultivar production. Um, but overly, I mean, overall, it's not like a, a lot more. It is significant, but it's only different from two cultivars in the first year and really one cultivar in the second year. Um, and then again, only one cultivar. Um, so some cultivars are gonna be a little bit higher producing than it, um, but overly not concerning. Um, so I wanna leave you with a few takeaways from this because um, how you manage your alfalfa can have an impact on future year's production. So looking at this graph, we have dry matter and stored energy reserves. And at the top, we'll have high and then low, high and low. So when looking at producing alfalfa, depending on your end goal, um, you might want to cut at the 28 days because you want the high quality. However, um, when you cut at the 28 day harvest interval, you're typically going to be cutting right around here, the bud or 10% um, bloom. But if you look down here, you're going to be at your lowest energy reserve. So if you're cutting at a time when you have no energy reserve, you're not going to have any energy for the next cutting. So you're gonna significantly impact um, how the regrowth of your next cutting of alfalfa, um, how it comes back, and it can even impact your future year's production. It will thin out stands. Um, plants that don't have energy reserves aren't gonna grow back. So um, you know, delaying your, your harvest to bloom um, can, can just give the plant a little bit more time to catch its breath, um, get back up, and have plenty of energy going forward. Um, here's another graph just to kind of um, have another takeaway on this concept. Um, so again, if people are cutting at 20 days, they're going to maximize on forage quality. They're getting 70% of overall forage quality. However, they're going to drop their persistent, or persistence and their yield to about 50%. Um, so if you just delay it, you're going to see about a 20 to 25% increase in all of those factors. So then looking at... Um, how our harvest intervals impacted, you know, you, we're, we're gonna see the greatest amount of quality, again, at the 28 day harvest interval that we had, um, but we're also gonna lose some of that stand. So overall, um, you need to think about the longevity of the stand. Um, how long do you want this stand to be producing? That can play a role in how you're gonna manage your alfalfa, um, both that year or in future years. Um, and then I just wanna draw a few conclusions about the data that I presented. Um, we did see that 35 days tends to be either greater or similar to that of the 42 day harvest. Um, and 28 days did have the least amount of biomass. We also noticed that Harv Extra or the HVX reduced lignin variety, um, it did have a little bit lower yield. However, it maintained greater crude protein and or greater or similar amounts of crude protein, lower um, lignin content, and overall has increased digestibility by about two and a half percent. We um, do have more years of data coming in. So this is only a partial data set. Um, so in the future, we should have a little bit more of a conclusive um, takeaway from this um, project. And um, at this time, I'll take any, any questions. Um, I don't know the, 
uh, equation off the top of my head, um, but it uses like your NDF value and a lot of times your TDN value too um, can influence that. And it depends on if you're looking at um, like a specific one for alfalfa because there are different RF um, V or RFQ value, uh, equations depending on what you're looking at. But Nope, you're good. <laughs> yes. Review for me, you talked about cutting dates and then what the plant does after it is going to extend it past the 28 period day. plant goes to cut into a dormant stage? No, it doesn't go into a dormant stage. It just allows the um, plant to take the energy that it's making from photosynthesis to then go down to the root system. Because when you come back and you cut it, um, there's no like plant material to activate photosynthesis, right? You remove all of the green um, biomass. So in order to regrow, it needs to use the plant's um, root reserves, so the energy that it has stored in the roots, and then it springs back up. Um, so it's kind of like it, what it would do when it greens back up in the spring. Um, it's just using It depends. So if you want a high quality, um, that's going to be your best bet. But if you're a producer who really cares about um, stand longevity, you might want to extend it out and go to a 35 day harvest interval because you're going to be getting more biomass with similar amounts of quality um, and you're going to be able to get that stand to stay um, producing for you a little bit longer. Uh, it kind of just depends. Uh, up to up to you. Um, if you do cut at 35 days, you're going to be able to get more cuts. So that might be a more added expense. You're going to have fuel um, and tractor um, costs that are going to add up. But if you don't care about that, you can extend it to 42 days. So it just kind of depends on your end goal. Oh, um, well, that also kind of depends. Um, most producers, so the harvest intervals are tied back to percent bloom. Um, so at 10% bloom is your, like your 28 days. Um, and it just depends on the location. So like when I was here in Stillwater harvesting alfalfa, my plots would only get to be about knee high for the 28 day. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I wouldn't say that would make a difference, but then again, I, I didn't look into that. So I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. All right, thank you, Elena. Good job.